to invite our speaker for this evening to come forward, Father Michael McGoldrick. There's a lovely custom in Carmelite convents that when a nun dies, the community sits down and thinks about her and they put together an obituary letter to send out to other communities and to friends of the community. And it's often very inspiring because you find out things you mightn't have known about a, a nun. Now, when Therese was dying, two sisters were overheard to say, what's the prioress going to write about her? She did nothing. The prioress was her own sister and she wasn't sure what to write. And so she left it aside for a few months. And then she remembered some notes that Therese had given her about their family life and about some of her experiences of God. So she decided to put that together and get it printed and sent out. And little could she have known the effect it was going to have. It's not unlike the reaction there was to the video of Sister Claire Crockett when it first appeared. People who read the book that um, Sister Pauline or Sister Agnes Pauline sent out were absolutely flabbergasted by it, by the depth of spirituality of this young woman. And they were all looking for copies of the book and it had to be reprinted and has never been out of print since and I think it's in something like 60 languages now. The story of a soul, which was the first words of the book, describe not just St. Therese's life, her family life and her experiences, but also her way to God, what she called her little way of confidence and love. And the focus is very much on Jesus as the giver of all gifts. We can't do anything ourselves. We go to God with empty hands, but with trusting hands because God will fill them. And so the little way means doing the ordinary things of every day with as much love as we can put into them. And that is not easy. And I think we all know that from experience. Things can go against us in the ordinary daily events of life and it's hard to, to be kind, to be patient, to be tolerant. If we're hurt, for instance, we may very well want to avoid the person who hurt us. We may be tempted to gossip and it's hard to resist that temptation. And there can be more serious things as well. We can be faced with um, illness, serious illness, and it can be hard to find God um, in that. To understand Therese's little way, I think it's important to understand something about her family life. Because we find the seed, sorry I mix up all my pages. In, in her family life we see the seeds of that journey of the little way. Her father Louis was, all his family had died by the time he was 30. And he felt the call to be a monk and he made a long journey down to the south of Switzerland to a monastery, the St. Bernard Monastery there, only to be told that he couldn't join because he didn't have Latin. He went home and tried to learn it but didn't succeed. And so he resigned himself to trying to be a good man, single man, and to give his life to God that way and learned how to become a watchmaker and jeweler and became very good at it. Zaley, um, Teresa's mother, grew up in a very difficult family situation. There was no affection whatever. The children, the girls were not even allowed to have dolls. It was a very harsh upbringing and Zaley would say later she wasn't able to show the kind of affection she wanted to her own children. She, as a young woman, started learning how to make lace because the lace in the town Alençon was quite famous. And then she felt she'd like to become a sister and she, with her mother, she went to the Daughters of Charity 
but unfortunately they wouldn't accept her because her health wasn't really up to it. And so she went back and continued with the lace making and set up a little business which became very successful. She had 16 local women working with her. And one of those was Louis's mother, Marianne. And Marianne was so impressed with Zadie that she thought she'd be a good catch for her son. So she introduced them and it worked. They fell very much in love with one another and they were married within three months. And so they saw that their love for each other was a sign from God that their way to God was to be through marriage and family. They were a very ordinary, devout couple, just like many couples here in Derry and in, in other places. They lived a very simple life. Work and play and prayer mixed very easy. They went to Mass every day and prayed. Um, they were very good to the poor. And Zaley wanted to have a lot of children so that she could give them to God. And they were blessed with nine children. But sadly, four of them died. Three within a year of being born, and one when she was five, Helene. And Zaley's heart was absolutely broken. She writes very movingly in her letters about how her heart was literally torn apart by the death of her children. Some people say that at the time it wasn't uncommon for children to die young, but when you read her letters, that's not the case. So when Therese was born, it was a great joy for, for Louis and Zaley. It was, it was as if God was making up in some way for the loss of the other children. Sadly, Therese didn't have good health as a child, and Zaley thought she was going to lose her as well. And she prayed to St. Joseph, and thank God, Therese survived and um, began to, to grow a healthy, healthy life. Uh, Zaley unfortunately developed breast cancer when she was about in her early 40s and it wasn't diagnosed for some time and by the time it was it was too late and she had a very painful illness and died um, when she was only 44. Therese was only four and a half at the time and it was an absolutely devastating experience for Therese. She was very close to her mother um, you know, she was a very affectionate child, a very headstrong child as well. Zaley wrote in one of her letters that Therese had kicked the housekeeper in the shin because she hadn't got her own way. And she said she's either going to be a great saint or a great sinner. Uh, thankfully, she became a great saint. When she died, Louis felt that there was need for a woman's influence in the house to just because there were five girls. So he thought it would be better to live near his brother-in-law, um, Isidore, and his wife, Celine, and their two daughters. So he rented a house in Lisieux near the Isidore and Celine. And that seemed to be a big help for the girls in adapting to the, the, um, the transition to the new place. A couple of years later, Pauline, the um, second eldest girl, decided that she wanted to become a Carmelite nun, or she felt called to become a Carmelite nun. Now, when Therese's mother had died, she, Therese had turned to Pauline and said, will you become my mother? So this was like a second bereavement for Therese. It was a dreadfully painful experience when um, Pauline left, and Therese wasn't even able to see her in the Carmel because she was very young. She and Celine, her sister, were brought in at the end of visits and given a couple of minutes, and that was a real heartbreak for her. And one of the things that happened to Ray's as a result of this whole experience of loss was a sort of nervous breakdown. It started off with headaches that became continuous. Then it became insomnia and shaking and hallucinations. And it went on for six months. And the family were at their wits' end. The father, who was very close to Therese, and the other four girls were at their wits' end. They were getting masses and prayers said, and nothing seemed to be happening for them. And then God intervened in a mysterious way. There was a statue of Our Lady of Victories in the room where St. Therese was. And Therese recounts that she had an experience of the lady smiling at her. 
and she began to feel better and to recover. And that was to have a very important role in Therese's devotion to Our Lady. She said, I found Our Lady to be more a mother than a queen. She was sent to school in the local um, Benedictine school and it was a difficult experience. The, the Martin family didn't mix an awful lot with others. With the result that Therese wasn't familiar with the games youngsters played and when she joined in the school, in the, into the, when she went to the school, she felt very out of place and didn't mix easily with the other girls. And they began to ridicule her and mock her. And it turned into a very, very lonely time. And she says that one of the few bright moments there was during that time was her first communion. She said she experienced it as the first kiss of Jesus. And that's very revealing because it showed the kind of relationship she had with Jesus. Louis and Zaley had taught the girls how to pray and not so much how to say prayers, but how to be friends with Jesus and talk to Jesus. And you can see that in Therese's experience of communion. And the Eucharist became a vitally important part of her life. At that time, people couldn't receive the Eucharist regularly, and it was a year before she received it a second time. And as she was preparing for her second communion, she began to become terribly scrupulous. She said it was a real martyrdom. She felt she had to tell her sister Marie about every single thought she had. And she just went through an awful time for 18 months. And in desperation, she decided to pray to her little brothers and sisters in heaven. She said, if you were alive now, you'd be looking after me because I'm the youngest in the family. And she asked them to pray for her that she'd be freed of this burden of scruples. And very quickly, the answer came. She says a beautiful thing. She said that soon peace came to inundate my soul with its delightful waves. And I knew then that if I was loved on earth, I was loved also in heaven. The scruples went, but that anxiety stayed with Therese for the rest of her life. And she had to struggle with it and fight against it. When she was 13, she had a little experience that became very significant for her. There was a custom in France at the time that children on Christmas Eve would leave their shoes at the fireplace so that the parents would put some surprises in them. Therese put hers out and she was going up the stairs to leave her coat and hat upstairs after midnight mass. And she overheard her father who had had a stroke saying, thanks be to God, this is the last year I'm going to have to do this. Now Therese would normally dissolve in tears with something like that. She broke down in tears for little or no reason at all. And she said that then she started crying because she had cried. But anyway, this time she decided, no, I'm not. I'm not going to give in to myself. I'm going to go down and be joke and you know be nice with my father and she did she said it took every fiber of her being to do it but she did it and she said that that I grew up that night it was like a conversion experience and from then self-pity never had a place in her life during the year after that experience her sister Marie entered the Carmelite monastery it wasn't quite as big a loss as Pauline, but it was a, a, a great loss for Therese because she'd been the one in whom she had confided everything about her scruples. And here was another sort of support gone out of her life. But interestingly, what it seemed to do was develop in Therese her own desire to become a Carmelite nun. And so she spoke to her father. Her father had been, he doted on her, he called her his little princess. And he'd really been a kind of model of what God the Father must be like. Anyway, she spoke to him and he was broken hearted that another, his favorite daughter, was going to leave him basically and that he'd hardly ever see her again. But being the man of faith that he was, he said yes. 
And he did something that was really significant, very providential for Therese. He went over to the wall near where they were sitting and picked a little flower out and handed it to Therese. And, and he told her about the way God created that flower and had preserved it uh, in its existence. And Therese kept that flower for the rest of her life. She put it in a prayer book and she carried it with her until the day she died. And she said that it became a symbol for me of what my life was to be. I was to be a little flower in the garden of God. Because she was only 15, there were problems about her entering because she was too young. And so she had to go to the local bishop to get his permission first of all. And there's a lovely photograph of Therese with her hair done up in a bun to make her look older. But the bishop didn't fall for it. He wasn't having any of it. She was too young as far as he was concerned. But Therese, she might have been a little flower, but she was no shrinking violet. The father, Louis, decided to take herself and Céline to Rome for a pilgrimage. And we see a very courageous and adventurous side of Therese in Rome. For instance, herself and Saline managed to get by the guards in the Colosseum and get down to the place where the martyrs were supposed to have been and prayed there. And then they went to meet the Pope and they were warned not to talk to the Pope. But Therese, being Therese, decided she was going to ask the Pope for permission to enter. And so she started talking to the Pope and had to be dragged away by the guards. The Pope said to her, if it's God's will, you will enter. And Therese was initially very upset by that because she felt as if the Pope was saying no. And then she realized, no, I want to do God's will more than anything else. And so she embraced that. The interesting thing was one of the priests on the pilgrimage was so impressed by Therese that he said to the bishop, that young girl should be allowed to enter the Carmel. And the bishop gave permission. And so she entered even though she was only 15 and she was really happy to enter but found the routine quite difficult. You can imagine a 15 year old going into um, a convent. You know, they got up at five o'clock in the morning and she found that really difficult. She found the cold in the winter very difficult. And also the attitude of some of the nuns was not great. Some of them were not at all happy that there was three members of one family in the community because they thought they'd have too much influence in the house. And they weren't slow about telling Therese of their disapproval. Therese was also totally impractical. It's hard to believe, but she never combed her own hair. Her sisters always did it for her. She'd never swept the floor. She'd never washed dishes. And of course she had to start doing things, these kind of things in the Carmel. And the nuns, some of the nuns were quick to criticize her for um, her clumsiness. And it really got to her once, and she went to an old nun who had been one of the foundresses, and the nun had some people with her, and she was going to go away, but the sister said, no, come here, I have a little word to say to you. And she said, serve God with peace and joy. Remember that our God is a God of peace. They were words that were to become very central to the life of Therese. One of the great things about Therese was that she never allowed obstacles to get in her way. Her response was always to look up the scriptures and see was there an answer there. And so she'd heard about this new in invention called the elevator. And she started looking through the scriptures to see was there anything that would fit. And she found the words um, in Proverbs, whoever is little, whoever is a little one, let them come to me. And the words in Isaiah, as one whom his mother caresses, so will I comfort you. You shall be carried at the breasts and upon the knees they shall caress you. And she said, the elevator that must raise me to heaven is your arms, O Jesus. For this, I need to remain little. She felt she was so small that Jesus would have to come down to the bottom of the elevator and lift her up. That image of the little flower that her father gave her became a very powerful um, motive for her life in the Carmel. 
she decided to be just a very ordinary person to, so that nobody would take any notice of her. There were some sisters in the community that were quite difficult and she would make a point of being friendly with them. So much so that one of her sisters said one day, you seem to like Sister X more than me. If there was a difficult job to be done, she would be the first to volunteer for it. And it cost her dearly. There were little things, but there were things that were very difficult. She says, it's a kind of funny story in some ways, but not so funny in others. She says that there was a nun beside her in the, in the chapel who used to grind her false teeth constantly during her prayer time. It's interesting that when her sister, sister Agnes, published the, these notes, she changed that to say that the sister was saying the rosary all the time. It's interesting that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't even have something like that admitted. Anyway, this got into Teresa's nerves, as you can imagine. You can imagine sitting beside somebody for two hours of prayer every day and that going on, and it drove her crazy. But she determined she wouldn't say anything. She would accept this for Jesus as an act of love for him. Another thing she mentions is they used to wash their clothes in cold water even in winter outside. And there was a sister who was forever splashing water on Therese. And again, she was tempted to tell her off, but she said, no, I'll embrace that um, out of love for Jesus. As her time as a nun went on, she began to, her prayer become much simpler. She said she found difficult prayers hard. They used to give her a headache. She found the rosary hard to, to um, concentrate on. And she said, I did what children do. I talked to God and said things the way I felt them. And she says a lovely thing about prayer. She said, it became an aspiration of the heart, a simple glance directed to heaven, a cry of gratitude and love in the midst of trial as well as joy. As Therese's prayer deepened, she felt a really strong desire to spread the message about Jesus to others. She wanted to be a priest so that she could preach the word. She wanted to be a missionary to carry the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. She actually volunteered to go to Saigon in Vietnam, but she was not accepted because of her health. And she said these feelings became a real martyrdom for her. And again, she went to the scriptures and she found in the letter to the Corinthians the piece about the body having different parts and that not all the parts can be the same. So she realized that not everybody can be a priest or an apostle or whatever, a missionary. And then she realized that a body needs a heart and the church needs a heart. So she felt that her role was to be love in the heart of the church. And she said, I have found my vocation. It is love. And that opened up huge horizons for her. She felt that even though she was very small and insignificant, her prayer could affect people all over the world and do good all over the world. Therese wasn't immune to sin like us all. Um, but she never let it discourage her. She said that, she wrote, If through weakness I sometimes fall, may your divine glance cleanse my soul immediately. Beautiful prayer of trust in God's mercy. Therese led a very unremarkable life as a nun. Nobody, even her own sister, seemed to notice what was going on in her spirit the heroicity of her love for Jesus and the community. Unfortunately, when she was 22, one morning or one night, she began to cough. And when she woke in the morning, her hanky was all covered with blood. And she knew exactly what that meant. It meant TB, tuberculosis and death. She tried to hide it at first, but then the cough made it, it was obvious to the sisters that she was seriously ill. And that carried on. She lived for 18 months. She had a very painful illness. Um, she suffered a lot because the treatment for TB at the time was very basic and very 
suppose you could say, crude, really, and it was, it was very painful. And it's interesting, Therese says to her sister in one of, her, one of their times together, she said, don't ever leave strong medicines around a person who's very ill because they'll be tempted to take them. It suggests that she was tempted to end her own life because she was in so much pain. And she says that the, the physical suffering was terrible, but it was nothing to the darkness that she felt, the inner darkness. She said God seemed to disappear out of her life. And she took some consolation out of that story where Jesus in the, is in the boat asleep during the storm on the Lake of Galilee. And she said, I offered my soul as a boat where Jesus could sleep. It's heroic, you know, when you, you hardly believe God exists to be able to offer yourself like that. She said that towards the end of her life, she didn't know whether there was a heaven or not. She died a, a very peaceful death when she was only 24. And in the weeks before she died, she said, I have a sense that my mission is only beginning, that I'm going to spend my heaven doing good on earth. And she's done just that. Her little way of confidence and love continues to inspire millions of people all over the world. Just your own presence here tonight is testament to that. And if things were, we didn't have COVID, this cathedral would be absolutely packed. Because Therese speaks to you, she says something valuable and attractive to you. Her way of confidence and love inspires all of us. And I think she has something important to say to us about holiness. That holiness is best lived in the ordinary. Because we want to start doing spectacular things. It's very easy for self-interest to get into the picture. When you're trying to do the ordinary things with as much love as you can, it's much harder. It takes a lot more generosity. And that's what she invites us to do. I think the expression blossom where you're planted catches what Therese did. And so whether we're young or old, whether we're single, separated or married, whether we're working or unemployed, the message is the same for every one of us. Trust in the merciful love of God and give of your best in response to that. Respond as, with as much love as you can. Don't be discouraged by your weakness. He says that we simply turn to God and ask his love and help. She says we can never have too much confidence in the mighty God, in the great God. He is so mighty and so merciful. And so my prayer for each of us is that she will obtain that gift of confidence in God's love and mercy for each of us. Those are just some of the, I suppose, main outlines of Therese's life and how she tried to live that vocation to be simple, to be ordinary, to be unremarkable, but with tremendous love. There's so much else in her life that I haven't been able to talk about because of shortage of time. But I hope that those insights into her life will you know, inspire you and help you in your own journey to God.